Well, Mika, we'll start right away. It's nine o'clock over here. Good morning, everyone, and good evening, Mika. I know it's a very tiring and long day for you, but <laughs> I should, I must thank on behalf of all of us for making yourself available at this point of very odd hours in Mexico City. Can you close the door, please? Okay. So, good morning, everybody, and a person who is involved in stem cell research for more than two decades. Who could be a better person than Professor Mikha Drucker to deliver a talk today at the stem cell workshop for all of us? Dr. Drucker is an expert in stem cell research for clinical applications. He has got actually a multifaceted, he has contributed to many areas of stem cell research. He has received his PhD from the Hebrew University, underwent postdoctoral research at Stanford University with Arving Eisman. Other day I have been talking about his first interaction with Arving. Mikha has become and received a tenure as a group leader and head of the induced pluripotent stem cell unit at Humboldt's center for, at Munich in 2012, also in 2018. He has become a full professor in 2020 in Led at Leiden University in Netherlands. Are you familiar with this name, Leiden University? If you are not able to connect, I just I will remind you. Every day we use the HEK 293 cells, and that's the university where it was isolated and derived. And he's now involved there in the Leiden Academic Center for Drug Research and Leiden University Medical Center. Mikha's interest lies in discovering mechanisms that regulate formation of the embryonic tissue using induced pluripotent stem cells in order to create novel method models for human disease, drug development, and emphasis on neurodegeneration. This line of research is also di directly con connected to using the stem cells the themselves as innovative living stem cell drugs. The lab, his lab focuses on multifaceted regulation by transcription and epigenetic factors. He's also a lot of other work. We need to make it to, to cut short. Today, he's going to talk on how stem cell technology can revive a distinct, a extinct species of animal. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Mikha Drukar to our workshop. Mikha, stage is yours. Mike thank is yours. Thank you so much. Thank you, so much. Uh, Thank you for the very kind introduction. Uh, can I ask how many people are in the room? I see like 15 people, but uh, are there more? Uh, there are more. There are more. The camera is not on the right side. There are more than 20. Say, okay. There are officially there are 20 participants, but my lab also coming up. So about 20, 25 yeah. between. And online. Okay. Yeah, go on, go on. Online, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I'll uh, I, I, I'll start. Uh, I'm obviously a little bit tired, but I'm going to try to make sense, and I'm going to try to reduce my accent a little bit. Uh, but you can also, uh, uh, from time to time, uh, remind me to speak slower or faster, and so on and so forth. And I hope that I'm going to make sense to you. Uh, can you see my pointer on the screen? Sure, oh, sure, sure. Awesome. Okay. So, uh, look, the idea is to, um, I mean, you have spent this workshop and uh, probably you worked with Sujui and with colleagues for quite some time now. And you know that stem cells in particular, pluripotent stem cells are uh, agents or, or beings of uh, cellular regeneration, as well as uh, obviously modality for, uh, for developing drugs, for testing drugs, for actually doing research with drugs. Um, a topic that actually I am um, uh, that grows on me recently is the use of stem cells as uh, agents for species revival, and I think it's important to make the case, and I'm going to make the case in the next, uh, I think, 15 minutes or so, before really showing you data, why this is important, and perhaps also trying to argue why it's important uh, for a country like India with uh, enormous biodiversity and perhaps some um, conservation efforts that are not enormously successful in some respects. So I hope that you are that you realize here that uh, I've illustrated here a whale and a rhino and an naked morat, and these are the vials where uh, you store uh, cells long term. 
Um, and the idea is indeed to talk today about how can we um, create a bank of cells from different animals as a, as a starting point to uh, enable in the future technology to bring them back. So let me see. Yes, okay. Now, uh, just to give a very brief introduction in the pluripotent stem cells and, uh, and in the use pluripotent stem cells. So you probably uh, spoke um, already extensively about um, embryonic stem cells, ES cells. This is the, the, the this pink point here in the middle of this illustration that portrays a blastocyst. And we know that we can hack into those cells, into pluripotent stem cells and blastocysts and, and convince them to become embryonic stem cells. And that's very cool because Embryonic stem cells can turn, in essence, into every cell type of the body. Uh, neurons, uh, cardiac cells, and uh, and basically any other cell types. And maybe you, you can already start uh, linking, the, uh, linking the thread to producing also gametes from embryonic stem cells, as well as from induced pluripotent stem cells. So iPSs induced pluripotent stem cells are created by uh, starting the process. The starting material would be somatic cells. And uh, then we use this magic um, uh, magic uh, uh, technique to reprogram them, to reset them to an embryonic-like phase. And thereby, I think uh, um, that we can approximate that induced pluripotent stem cells and ESLs are more or less the same, or are the same for our for for the sake of the, the discussion today. And they also can differentiate by applying different uh, uh, different uh, protocols. And different differentiation factors to uh, to all cell types uh, of the body. Now, what I'm trying to portray in this slide is that pluripotency is uh, is a uh, fascinating uh, or reprogram is a fascinating process, uh, a back to the future like process. And I hope that you watch the movie because it's a very important movie to watch if you want to understand stem cells, where in the lifetime of a person or an animal you can turn the somatic cell into indefinite pluripotent stem cells. So the function that was transient, the pluripotency was transient, is now becoming permanent as, 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 um, as in the case with embryonic stem cells. Now, typically I would uh, give lectures on the vision, the, the medical vision uh, in our lab, which I call the cell pharmacy. Uh, this is an illustration that my daughter prepared um, for trying in a New Yorker style um, image, uh, the future where we want to, to go. We would like to be able to create organs, replacement tissues, in order to uh, to cure, for example, diabetes and Parkinson's disease and so on and so forth. And this is basically obviously a metaphor because cell pharmacy will not exist, uh, at least not a, a cool shoop like that, but it will be uh, technologies that are applied in, uh, applied in, um, in, uh, in medical centers. But in a way, that's what we want to, to reach uh, in the future. So towards that, we do a lot of research, as uh, as uh, Suji mentioned, in an area that I call developmental stem cell biology. So we are stem cell biologists, but we actually study bio developmental biology using the cells in order to turn them into something that is useful. Uh, we published quite extensively on uh, the early progenitors that differentiate from pluripotent stem cells, the mechanisms, mechanisms controlling controlling a tissue that is called trophoblast tissue, other disease modeling uh, studies in order to uh, in order to understand the human disease using pluripotent stem cells and mechanisms that regulate uh, pluripotency differentiation. Uh, I hope that you can see here below, um, a, actually a new study, a relatively new study from my lab, where we turn our, our attention to uh, rhino of all, uh, of, an, of all animals. And we turn our attention to rhino because we think that we may be able to contribute to something very fundamental in the um, uh, in the long term survival. So I would like to uh, to exemplify the problem. Um, I'm not sure if uh, to what extent you are aware, but we are currently uh, in a process of global crisis of de declining biodiversity, and this is uh, an illustration demonstrating that the rate of extinction of species is actually ever accelerating now, um, ever accelerating now, uh, whether uh, we are looking at mammals or vertebrates and, and, and invertebrates. I uh, I would advocate to read, this, uh, to read this book called The Sixth Extinction, uh, showcasing that we are currently in the sixth amplitude of mass extinction in the history of history, not the history of mankind, history of history. So we are basically under, basically there's a process of man-made uh, uh, um, man-made poaching and uh, and 
habitat loss leading to uh, to massive loss of species uh, globally. And the problem is can be also uh, be illustrated like that because typically I would think that there are conservation efforts that uh, bear fruit. However, I would argue that that's often not so much the case. And if anything, uh, we are aware today that for more species, the rates of uh, speeds of extinction actually are e accelerating now, despite the enormous um, con uh, enormous conservation, the conservation efforts. Um, and uh, you may also sometime uh, consider that uh, there are breeding uh, breeding programs, for example, in zoos. Uh, uh, and we know that they are extremely important in conserving species. However, and there is an elephant in the room, so to say. Um, also, the breeding, breeding programs come with quite a lot of problems uh, that we don't know exactly how to, or, or we don't know well how to solve. For example, for elephant species, we know that approximately 10% of them will, uh, of the newborn elephants will die from hepatitis, sorry, herpes, uh, herpes virus. In uh, Asiatic lions, uh, we know hereditary ataxia uh, leads to a decline of the species, dramatic decline of the species. By the way, I think it's, uh, it's uh, a species that exists, I think it, it, uh, it lives uh, in India. And uh, for black rhinos, uh, there is a very weird uh, or, or unexplained disorder called iron overload disorder, affecting approximately 30% of the population that lives in, in, uh, in uh, captivity, reducing their breeding. So uh, what I'm saying and what I'm showing about these uh, phenomena, uh, the syndromes, this is actually a cherry picking of a uh, few uh, disorders that I came across while attending a research symposium at, uh, at, uh, at Rotterdam Zoo. But this is meant just to illustrate the problem. This, the problem is that most species uh, that are declining in their numbers uh, are in a dire state of decline. And I would like to exemplify this with the, the census of rhinos. And you can see here, um, I think these are all the rhino species. And there is this uh, special species that we really like called the Northern right Rhino for which only two specimens exist today, living and they're both in, uh, infertile, by the way. Southern white rhino are more numerous, there are about 10,000 of them, and black rhinos, there are a couple of thousands. However, there are other species where you see that the numbers are very low, like Sumatran rhino, Javan rhinos. There are basically three out of the six species of rhinos are, one can say, on brink of extinction. And I'm uh, placing, uh, and I decided to speak about this topic today because I'm would like to uh, incentivize, incent give incentive to also work on this problem and to try to conserve uh, the, uh, the biodiversity, very unique biodiversity that exists, for example, in uh, in India. So uh, I would advocate to take initiative and to think about stem cells as agents for species revival. And I will show you uh, what is our thinking process in order to uh, to come to that. Uh, you're probably all thinking there are uh, about examples like you know existing collections and uh, existing collections indeed exist for, for example, for plants. Uh, we call them uh, seed banks, and they are very important in order to safeguard the genetic rescue by preserving the the, the seeds. However, um, we don't need uh, very sophisticated freezers in order to keep them, and also seeds are the embryo itself. So you can just take a seed and plant it in the ground, and it will grow into the plant that you're interested in. We have to develop technology that takes other stuff from animals in order to bring uh, to bring the species back. And I'll show you, I'll show you how. There are uh, programs about the extinction using DNA. Perhaps some of you watched uh, Jurassic Park in the future, and if you haven't, you should. Uh, and this idea is basically exemplified by the work of colossal biosciences where Joel Church and, and colleagues are uh, attempting uh, to bring back the woolly mammoth using DNA. However, DNA is obviously a naked molecule. It cannot by itself bear life. And therefore, whether you start from a living cell from, or from an ancient DNA and synthesize chromosomes, like colossal biosciences, you will have to go via cells, via stem cells very likely, in order to uh, create species from, uh, from cells whether this is in the process of de-extinction or from an existing animal. So the idea is obviously uh, to use uh, pluripotent stem cells uh, and uh, as a basis, as a starting point, to make oocytes 
And all sites we know actually fairly well for um, some, for more than a handful of species, to turn them into, 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 into animals. Now, what I would like to highlight here, and I will show some data about this later, is actually that this process, starting from a blastocyst and even IPSs, going all the way to differentiation in vitro to all sites, fertilization by in vitro fertilization and artificial reproduction technologies and embryo transfer can accomplish living mice even today. This has already been accomplished by our colleague, Katsuyo Koyashi at Osaka University. So the proof of concept of the story that I'm telling you is actually already, uh, uh, is already, uh, already exists. So the question is, could IPSs power the conservation uh, efforts by synthetic, uh, synthetic uh, embryos? And I would like to show you here um, uh, another movie. Well, I'm not going to show the entire movie, but I'm going to demonstrate here. Can you hear the sound? Perhaps you can. So um, in, in Avatar, this movie Avatar, um, this technology has been demonstrated or basically portrayed as, as cloning technology that brings back um, the, the tiger from extinction in some hundreds of years from now. What I would like to actually claim today that uh, we are trying to do something different. We are not trying to clone animals. We rather try to make gametes and via gametes, uh, meiosis actually takes place, obviously, and therefore increasing the genetic diversity. So the plan uh, uh, that we uh, that uh, we are part of, in order to uh, to bring back uh, or basically help the, the long term survival of the northern rhino, includes the use of uh, uh, the use of induced pluripotent stem cells, their differentiation to promote their germ cells, either from a female to all sides or male to sperm, and then uh, using uh, using embryos as uh, as a basis to uh, transfer for surrogate females from another another species very likely, and then recreate the species. Now, what I have to say is that uh, that this uh, work is led uh, by uh, Thomas Hildebrand from the Leibniz Institute in, uh, in, uh, in Berlin. Uh, they are the him and his lab are true pioneers in, in, this, uh, in, this, uh, in this area. Um, and again, the point that I wanted to, to uh, that I made before is that the genetic diversity uh, will be an issue with this technology, obviously, because we're going to start with the small populations, but much less than cloning, because the process will uh, start with uh, with gametogenesis. Okay, um, I would like also to advocate for additional motivations that are that can be useful. Uh, that are additional motivations for establishing an IPS or zoo as such. For example, we can think about this as a new way to uh, to study cellular natural history. The classical way that you study natural history is obviously by in museums or collecting uh, collecting stuffed animals and so on and so forth, or even collecting uh, skeletons and comparing different species and trying to come up with hypotheses or answers to why the genetic diversity or why. Uh, why uh, why species evolve uh, the way they are. What I'm proposing here with the establishment of these such collections of cells is basically uh, a concept to uh, concept to understand the regulation underlying this diversity. Because if we are cells and we compare different, uh, we compare stem cells from different species, this can be a starting point for evolutionary and development studies, understanding the mechanisms by which, uh, the, uh, uh, by which, for example, physiology or morphogenesis actually takes place with uh, comparing different species. There's additional motivation that I uh, listed here. For example, uh, zoonosis uh, research, uh, coronavirus, we know affect, affects, uh, affects uh, for example, bats and armadillos and such. So just imagine the possibility of having, uh, having uh, cells already banked, uh, enabling you when uh, the next pandemic comes to study the effects, the interaction directly between uh, between pathogens and uh, and cells. For example, the lung of uh, of of the bat. I'm just making it up. Also, there are additional uh, additional uh, additional uh, possibilities. For example, alternatives for animal farming, creating uh, creating artificial meat, and so on and so forth. Now, with this approach of cellular natural history. Uh, we are actually um, uh, are deeply involved in such uh, such efforts because I think they are extremely interesting in order to understand uh, deeper uh, how 
we become to be so large or so small or, or live in burrows or, or, or basically fly. So uh, one of the questions that we are asking is about the timing of cellular differentiation. So what is the pace of cellular differentiation? What controls that? And we do this by comparing different species. Uh, this is a manuscript that we have in preparation. We have other, uh, other uh, manuscripts, for example, in review, where we ask, for example, this body axis, Suji knows me that I'm very tall and I have a huge body axis. So the question is, how come, uh, what is basically the, the underlying mechanism controlling a huge body axis, for example, look for whale versus a human, and how this actually elongates when uh, my daughter grows to, uh, to the height of uh, 170 centimeters, for example. And there are other applications for this support. So what I'm trying to say is that in addition to uh, to basically this, uh, this idea of establishing uh, IPS cell zoo or cell zoos can be very useful also beyond the idea of, uh, of recreating uh, endangered species. I may skip this actually. And then I would like to show you uh, basically a template, if you will, of how you should approach this. If you're interested in, in setting it up, for example, in India or elsewhere, and of course I would be very happy to, to help. It's actually quite uh, quite a sophisticated and actually complicated process. You need to obtain permits uh, in order to uh, to isolate biopsies. You need to sample in the field often uh, and the, uh, the samples. You need to transfer them, cryopreservation. preservation. You need to work on the procedure to make IPSs from different species, which is not trivial at all. And then uh, you'll have to uh, to differentiate the cells to sperm and all sites, and the dot of the, of the horizon will be to transfer the embryos to foster females in order to create a species again. You need a lot of diverse expertise in order to do that if you really want to, to bring uh, stem cell, uh, to bring species back. But I would advocate first to create uh, to create uh, collections. You need the legal advice also just for the obtaining of, uh, of, uh, of permits. You need to educate veterinarians and to network uh, with, uh, with animal caretakers. You need to know quite a lot about genomes as well. And bioinformatics, in order to understand what you're collecting and what uh, and and what is genetic diversity, for example, and you really need to know yourselves as well, understanding understanding uh, reprogramming, for example, and so to engage in a lot of scientific uh, collaborations, which I find very cool. This is how the process starts for us. Uh, you can see here an uh, an IVF uh, effort, actually not IVF, sorry, artificial reproduction technology. You can see here Thomas Hildebrandt uh, attempting and successfully attempting uh, to isolate uh, all sites from uh, from uh, from uh, a female rhino. So you can see that a lot goes into that in order to, uh, to find that one cell that can make uh, make the spark to make uh, to make a whole life. And if you're interested in that, you should look at. Uh, uh, Thomas Hildebrandt's group uh, and uh, the Biorescue Project, where they are uh, working intensely on creating more, uh, more, uh, 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 more rhinos. This is Thomas Hildebrandt. That's uh, actually me with a different haircut. And together, uh, Thomas has initiated that in Germany. I've initiated that in uh, in London, for example. We are establishing collections of IPS Azu, including, and I placed this photo here. This is a very famous bear in. Uh, in uh, in Germany, that's why Knut here is in, in that image. But for you in India, it's not uh, that important. So uh, many freezers in order to uh, to accomplish that. Now, uh, the challenge here, I mean, there are many challenges, but one of the challenges is to develop reprogramming technology for understudied species. These are not mice so or human. You need to basically often uh, optimize the process with very limited knowledge about embryonic development, but it's possible. Um, so the starting material could be biopsy of skin. It can be even be urine, it can be blood, uh, hair plaque also. And then you'll have to choose your uh, reprogramming technology of, uh, of choice. Uh, for example, using mRNA technology, which we use, um, you know, the, very similar to the COVID vaccinations that probably most of you received, in order to accomplish reprogramming without uh, making an impact or, or without changing changing the genome of this of the cells of uh, of these uh, these uh, species. So, cellular reprogramming using mRNA is transient. Uh, these factors already is transient, like the coronavirus uh, vaccination uh, by mRNAs that was given to you. So after a few days, it perishes completely, not leaving any mark on the genome. And here you can see um, uh, a movie illustrating uh, this uh, process of cellular reprogramming of human fibroblasts. 
And what I'm trying to illustrate with this uh, with this uh, with this movie is that actually it's a really difficult uh, process. I mean, very few of the cells actually reprogram. Uh, you will see that actually towards the end of the movie, only two colonies emerge. So there are only two cells that uh, for the two fibroblasts that uh, that uh, that turned into into iPS cells. You can see them emerging here and here. So it's a very rare, very inefficient process but it works. So you'll have to optimize the process to work with different fibroblasts, for example, of different animals or different uh, different cell types. You can see the nice colon is growing, but this is with defined conditions for, uh, for example, for the human. Now, in order to explain the next couple of slides, I have to mention as well that uh, iPS cells exist in a couple of flavors, but I think the most important one to mention are the prime state, uh, um, prime state and the naive state. Uh, naive state. So you can think about them as early and late or early and advanced type of um, of stem cells. You can see here the primed on the top and the naive on the bottom. And what I would like to explain is that the human uh, iPS cells, they exist mostly in the prime state. That's how we grow human iPS cells. The mouse is actually different. We typically culture them as uh, this naive or ground, uh, ground state. What uh, others and us have been showing over the years is actually this is interchangeable in human and mice. So you can go from the prime state to the naive state and also from the, uh, this naive state into the, into the prime state of, of the mice. And that's important because when we try to make in these pluripotent stances from new species, we may want to consider different protocols or different cocktails are important for the prime to the ground state because we don't know so much about the underlying biology of uh, these species. So uh, thankfully, we have rather good uh, cocktails, I'd say, or basically knowledge of signaling cascades that are used in the mouse and the human in order to promote the self-renewal of, uh, of uh, inner cell masses of basically pluripotent stem cells or, or prime pluripotent stem cells. For example, for the ground state, we're using wind beta catenin um, agonist. For the human one, uh, we use uh, FGFs and activin and so on and so forth. So you can see this as, uh, as, as imagine this as columns of conditions. Now, when we come to novel species like the rhino, we need to consider those things, what conditions we would like to use and test hopefully more than one condition in order to basically give, uh, I mean, higher chances of, uh, of success. Now, uh, this has been performed, I mean, this uh, sort of optimization and uh, exploration of reprogramming in other species have been done by many, not just us, obviously. And so far, I can say that uh, that uh, in this pluripotent stem cells have been made mostly for mammals or almost exclusively all, all, only for mammals. Uh, but I'm actually quite optimistic that uh, that we will also see uh, reprogramming successful in uh, in birds in the in the next uh, in, in the next years. What I would like to show you here is actually what species, and this is updated about a year ago, uh, what species uh, uh, of mammals uh, have been used in order to have been used as a starting point for iPSs. Um, and uh, so you can see, for example, bats and uh, bats and snow leopards and, uh, and so on and so forth as, as shown here. The red ones are species in our lab, including Asiatic lions from, from India, I think. Uh, that we have not reprogrammed into iPSs yet, and we actually don't know if it's possible. Uh, but you can see other species that we've reprogrammed or obtained from others, like bat iPSs and rhino iPSs. And recently we had success also with the elephant shrew. We haven't published this yet, but we will publish this. Elephant shrew is a very cool small animal that you can see in this, uh, this, this uh, clip here, running around. And it's actually a relative of the elephant. However, it's not an elephant. It's actually not a shrew either. It is an animal of the Afroterio clade, and that's actually a very vast and very complex clade of mammals. And elephant shrew, to my knowledge, is the first uh, first uh, uh, iPSs that were made from this Afroterio. So the others are representing other clades in uh, in uh, other clades of uh, mammalian in, in mammalian uh, evolution. So I think we can uh, perhaps with this technology that we optimized for the. Elephants will perhaps even go to the to the elephants uh, soon. Now, finally, let's, let's talk a little bit about the elephants. Uh, I would like to mention that, uh, as, as I said at the beginning, uh, two specimens of the northern right rhino remain alive now, uh, Fatu and uh, Najim. And uh, together with Thomas Silderbrand, Sebastian Dike, and other uh, other people, Koyashi that I mentioned, of course, 
we came up with an idea how to uh, propose to rewind the process of mammalian extinction. And then also we got to work uh, together with our colleagues and uh, we also collaborated in the studies. We have uh, produced uh, southern white rhino embryonic stem cells from embryos. You can see here Thomas and his colleagues isolating eggs from uh, from uh, from uh, from uh, a rhino. Uh, that egg can be uh, fertilized, and then it goes into blastocyst. I'm sure that you've uh, seen those things before. And then we explanted the inner cell mass, and uh, our colleagues explanted the inner cell mass and grew lines of embryonic stem cells. In this case, of the southern white rhino. And that was important because it served to us as, uh, as a, basically as a starting point to optimize conditions that we uh, would like to use for the northern white rhino, which is much more uh, uh, rare, as we said. And we also were uh, looking into converting or seeing whether we can convert the prime state uh, rhino cells into naive state, and I will explain in a minute why. So this has been successfully published this uh, recently. Uh, we made uh, northern white rhino <coughs> IPS cells. Uh, from uh, from uh, this specimen, uh, old lady called Nabira, she passed away uh, since we, we made these IPS cells, not because of us, just of old age. Uh, and what we were also able to do in the study is actually to transform those, transform or actually convert these uh, IPS cells that were human-like in, in the, the stage to, uh, to the naive states. And let me show you why this is important, because naive cells have a better chance of making uh, more tissues in tests of pluripotency. So what we've done actually, a really crazy experiment that we published here. We, uh, we, sorry? I can hear someone in the background. Is that Sujay? Okay, anyway, so I can continue. I mean, is it okay? Should I continue? Please continue, please continue. Oh, yeah, okay, so um, I was about to say that we uh, turned uh, turned or converted the the uh, prime state pluripotent stem cells to naive state, and then we did I mean quite an uh, I'd say uh, exceptional experiment where we transplanted this rhino IPS cells naive state into the blastocyst of mice. So we made a human, sorry, not of course, mouse rhino chimera, mouse rhino chimera. And by doing that, we were able to show that the uh, naive uh, stage uh, IPS cells contribute actually, as we hypothesized, contribute more vastly to more tissues in the settings. And that was actually important in order to show that the cells are truly pluripotent and they can make uh, different cell types. Uh, because pluripotent stem cells from the prime state often have biases that restrict them from differentiating to all cell types. So this is a, uh, to prove the case that uh, probably uh, Northern white rhino IPSs can create, uh, or basically support the idea that northern white rhino IPSs can make all tissues of the body. Meanwhile, uh, I mean, this this was published, and also the southern white rhino IPSs were published, and then as well the Sumatran rhino uh, IP, IPSs were published, was published recently, and also participated in in that. Now the question is obviously, how is it? Uh, I mean, how feasible is it to produce function gametes from rhino IPSs or any other IPSs? And I already told you that it's possible in the mouse, and I would like to show you what this uh, this actually entails. I'm not going to go into details, and this is really the work of Katsuyo Kayashi. Uh, he is a magician uh, of uh, of primordial germ cell differentiation, starting with uh, with pluripotent stem cells, turning the cells into by stepwise differentiation, like Paul surgery that teaches you, into primordial germ cells, and then differentiating the cells into gonad-like cells. And quite amazingly, this process of making model follicles and then meiosis in vitro actually works. And uh, you can see here uh, these follicles that Casilco uh, in his, uh, I mean, trail uh, in in uh, in a series of, pa of papers that he published in excellent journals, have been uh, have been showing to make follicles and then actually as well eggs. And these eggs are fertile. He can turn them into uh, into into mice. And this is shown here. Uh, following uh, meiosis two, uh, uh, meiosis two, um, uh, these uh, these embryos that were made entirely in vitro, I remind you, from pluripotent stem cells, have been fertilized by ICSI, developing two or four stage embryos and then into blastocyst, and Katsuyuki can also inject inject them uh, to foster moms, 
and actually create mice from them. And these mice are also fertile creating the next generation. So this really showcased that the whole process can work, at least in mice for now. Katsuyuka, and we help a lot uh, as, as well, a little bit sometimes, uh, can also differentiate the southern white rhino and the northern white rhino uh, into germ cells-like cells, and there was a recent publication about that as well. Uh, and uh, perhaps, I mean, this is a very busy slide. I'm not going to uh, talk about uh, the, the left portion of it, but perhaps it's worthwhile mentioning that uh, the differentiation trajectory to primordial germ-like germ cells of the mouse takes place in a similar fashion according to the principle component analysis in the human and the rhino as well, all in vitro. So basically this gives hope that this is also possible with, uh, with, uh, with the rhino species ideal cells. Now, there are very exciting news from the group in, uh, in, uh, in Berlin. They have actually been, uh, they are actually accomplished embryo transfer for a southern right rhino, not made from IPSs, but from, from an embryo. However, uh, sadly, the female actually died from, from completely unrelated reasons. I mean, had nothing to do with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with um, uh, this, this process of embryo transfer. But this at least proves that you can make from an egg, you can make a rhino fetus. That's actually really important because at the next steps, we may, um, Thomas and his team may want to use uh, very rare, precious eggs that they have from the northern white rhino. And then later, of course, and those that emerge from, uh, from IPSOs. So uh, very briefly, uh, to go beyond the story uh, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, making the stem cells for uh, for bringing species back. Um, I have a few more slides briefly to, uh, to advocate, for example, for, uh, for research of, uh, of uh, infectious diseases. Um, bat IPSs actually were recently produced by our colleague Thomas Tswaka in, uh, in, uh, in New York. And actually, you can see that in the gene ontology analysis, the genes are actually expressed in, uh, in, uh, in, these, uh, in these embryonic stem cells. Coronavirus-related uh, disease um, gene ontology uh, marks, or basically properties, are highly, uh, highly present in these ESs, indicating perhaps this is quite speculative, but indicating perhaps because they are hosts for those uh, coronaviruses, for example, they have mechanisms on board that deal that uh, that mimic uh, coronavirus uh, infection. So perhaps is a resistant mechanism of these uh, embryonic cells. But this, this is uh, this is to be explored uh, uh, following up on this uh, on this very interesting uh, cell paper. So what I'm saying here is that if you collect an interesting species, you turn it into IPSs, maybe something that can be extremely useful also for uh, for medicine. Okay, I think that I'm coming very close to the end. Um, I tried to basically advocate for. Uh, thinking not about just stem cell, cell technology of uh, people and mice, rather also beyond the conventional drug applications, whether this is a drug cells or, uh, or uh, a, a, base, a foundation to study drugs and molecules, for example, actually to, uh, to use uh, stem cells in order to study development to, uh, and, uh, and also ensure by collecting uh, collecting uh, uh, cells ensure and that's what's shown in, in the on the left ensure for the future crop preservation and enabling technologies perhaps generations for now to bring back species uh, uh, using uh, stem cell technology I would like now to thank uh, in la uh, in uh, to the people who did most of the work that I've shown, so Ayana Rusha and uh, Polixani Netli uh, in the lab in Munich that I'm still uh, that I'm, I'm still uh, uh, I'm still collaborating with very closely to the Max Delbruck Center Sebastian Dike and uh, Vera who collaborate with us on Rhino related uh, uh, projects. Katsuyo Koyashi, I mentioned him many many times uh, is a, extremely um, is a magician of. Uh, of uh, differentiation protocols of uh, of all sites and in in Berlin, uh, Thomas Hildebrand and his uh, and his uh, wonderful team, and of course I would like also to mention some funding uh, funding organizations like the John Templeton Foundation that supports uh, supports some of our effort in this uh, direction, uh, uh, the Volkswagen Stiftung Foundation, uh, and um, yes, I think with this I'm happy to to stop and uh, to take the, take your questions. Okay, Mika, thank you very much, Mika. Can you unshare your Slides. Stop sharing. 
Yeah, stop sharing so that we can see you properly. Amit, can you put him on the pin? Yeah, on. Not that one. He put him on the his live one. The, his live one, the one. I cannot see myself now for, for whatever reason. He's his oh, speaker. Ka. Okay, I'm here. Okay. Yeah, I can see myself now. Hello. Hello. One moment, one moment. Mikha ko bada, bada kar dijiye na screen mein, taki sab dekh paayenge. Yeah, Mikha, now you are good. We, we can see you properly. I'm so, always good. <laughs> you are always there. Omnipotent, omnipresent. Okay, no issue. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> okay. So I will ask my colleagues if they want to ask you some questions. I will save my questions for you later on. If anybody from anywhere, um, any online, anybody? I think there are some questions in the chat. Something there are some. wanted to ask a question. But one of the participants among 20, Prashant is from my lab. Okay, he wants to ask some question. Yeah, please. Yeah. Hello, sir. Good morning, sir. Uh, my question is, is it possible to produce the whole organism by transferring the nucleus of primary spermatocyte into an enucleated oocyte or transferring the two go female slow, Go slow, go slow. Yeah, exactly, you are a little bit fast for me. Okay, yeah. Or by transferring the nucle uh, two pronucleus from the female into an enucleated oocyte so that we will get the deployed parthenogenetic embryo so we can produce the whole organism. Because there are reports like rats and mites are born by this way. But there is no research in these mammals. So if you mean, uh, you mean, uh, slow down. I mean, do you mean pathogenesis? You're asking if you, this pathogenesis can be used as basically starting point? Yes, sir. Um, it's a good question. I mean, it's a really good question. I have to think about it. Um, I'd say maybe yes. Uh, but, you know, of course, the pathogenic embryos have some, uh, some ab ab epigenetic abnormalities. And some organisms can do that. I mean, uh, obviously. Uh, but uh, as far as we know, parthenogenesis is not uh, is not a canonical way of producing mammals. I mean, it's, if anything, I think there was one rat, and maybe it can be done in lab conditions for for mice. Uh, but I think it's very rare uh, otherwise in any other mammal. Uh, so, but I have to think about it. It's a good question. Uh, what is the implications on the epigenetics or the chromatin abnormalities, perhaps, of parthenogenic parthenogenetic uh, uh, nuclei in that respect? Yes, because Prashant, somatics. Prashant, every word has to be very slow and very distinct. Otherwise, nobody will understand. Yes, if we can reprogram the somatic cells into IPAC and IPAC into gonads like sperm and uh, this ovum, so why can't we bring back this paternal imprinting in the diploid parthenogenetic embryo so that we will get whole offspring? So it will be easiest way to produce a whole organism. As I said, I'll have to think about it. Uh, this is a really fascinating uh, prospect. Uh, maybe indeed, like you're saying, this is I mean, uh, this is the way to go. But I'll have to vet it a little bit. Uh, uh, a very nice idea. Very nice idea. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay, Mikhail, I will st I will ask a few questions now to you. Yeah, so, go for it. Yeah. So, amongst the different strategies to reprogram. So what is the most successful one in your hand? What is the, which effort, which strategy that you have more successfully used? Is yeah, that- I mean, it's also a very good question. I mean, it's very hard to say because I mean, it's always a compilation of starting cell, reprogramming methodology, um, and the conditions that we apply in order to promote the self renewal, clone propagation and so on and so forth. It's, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's very hard to say there's a magic bullet that will work for everything. However, if you want to rely on something that has, I mean, a very strong potency, I'd say what is very potent with blood cells or with uh, urine cells or fibroblasts is sender virus. Sender virus works very well. Okay. Uh, of course, you'll have to work a little bit you know, to propagate the cells to get rid of it. Uh, but this is a method methodology that uh, that uh, that ensures success in in uh, in many reprogramming experiments in the human and the mouse. But still, I have to say that uh, that. Uh, for if you have to tweak 
to tinker with the reprogramming factors, that's going to be very hard with standby virus because these are typically a kit and a cocktail that is set. So it's not going to be, I think it's not trivial whatsoever uh, to produce your own standby virus. Let's put it this way. Um, if you want to play around with things, I mean, the plasmids will be much more um, uh, like episodal plasmids that we use also in this line of case. It probably is the way to go. And then if you want to ensure that uh, that your reprogramming is transient, you can use mRNAs as well. So for the case, in the case of the Northern Rhino, Northern White, northern white Rhino, yeah. which you have... No, so we use we have plasmids. We use episodal plasmids, non-integrating plasmids, and I can tell you that it works in other species like uh, the elephant shrew as well. Uh, so, and uh, I mean the references are there in the study, or I can give you the information. I mean it works; it's quite uh, powerful. Mm -hmm. However, one has to be cautious because uh, the non-integrating uh, plasmids sometimes integrate as well, although. So the, the plasmids themselves, uh, you know, they don't read uh, labels on uh, uh, tubes, mm -hmm. and uh, sometimes they tend to integrate. So one has to be uh, has to to do uh, the full due diligence of the outcoming clones. So in the case of this uh, northern rhino, northern uh, white rhino, which spermatozoa did you use? The, the case in the case of the that guy who, from your your collaborator who isolated the. Uh, oocyte and then fertilized with spermatozoa. Where did you get the sperm? Yeah, so I mean, there is quite a lot of sperm frozen down. So I mean, for males, it's a less of a problem in northern right rhino, and also for for and other males. Uh, so eggs are much much more precious in that. Uh, all sets are much more precious. Uh, there, there are quite a lot of vast collections and they are frozen down. Um, so with that. I would worry much more about, or basically focus much more on the female germline rather than the male, male germline. So how about the, I, I have one uh, that about the naive, getting the naive iPS cells. So yep. can you really control that? I mean, meaning that the, whether the cells which we are, we are going to get the iPS cells induced pluripotent stem cells are going to be naive or the primed one, can we control it from the a priori, meaning that if I use this cocktail, we'll get into that, or or is it a or is it by chance we get into that? Um, it's a good question. Um, you can go, of course, for the prime to naive, naive to the primed. Um, we we actually, I mean, we typically when we try a new species, we just do as many different cocktails as we can at the same time, and also make modifications on the go. Because it's a little bit like, you know, we are a little bit like cell doctors, right? You know, we look at them, say, okay, is there MET going on? Or, or basically, this is a stress. So you can, you know, do it, they need more metabolizers, metabolites, and so on and so forth. We're trying to control this, is control with different mediums, rich mediums, typically the rich mediums, for example. Um, so uh, I'd say that uh, there's no one strategy, but perhaps the strategy is just try as much as you can. So of one course, you know, as, 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 of course, it matters, you know, if you have many conditions, then you need to also multiply that by uh, by uh, by the reprogramming methods that you may use in parallel. So it can actually, and then the so densities and so on and so forth. So it actually can become quite a, quite a big process. Okay. I one more one more personal questions. You personal, okay. You showed the picture, sorry, painting or draw, drawing by Lotem, actually, your daughter. How yeah. old when she draw, drew it? Uh, I think she was 13 or so. 13? Yeah. yeah. Good. I mean, she drew this picture of your lab, that that all, all the work that you have been doing it? Ah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. She's, uh, she, she's a talented painter, I mean, artist, and she's yeah. also talented in many other things. Yeah. Uh, Looks fantastic. If fantastic. anybody from online, if Dr. Ghosh, you have a question? From... Yeah, I, I have, uh, although I couldn't attend his full lecture, so I have, hi. Uh, no. This is related to the IPS, what is generated from the poultry, what is the future of it? And then second is, could you derive the PGC from it and then try to see the germline transmissibility? I'm sorry, I mean, uh, you'll have to slow down a little bit, you know. So first, I'll ha I didn't get all the nuances of the question. Um, and I also have to to be to uh, 
for few uh, for full diligence to say that uh, those studies were published by Katsuyo Kobayashi. I didn't do them. Okay, uh, those with Primoda gem cells. But can you repeat your question, please? I mean, slower. From the I means the IPS. What is generated from chicken? What is the future? A chicken. Of sorry, okay. What is the future? No, they of have not. Be, they have not been made yet. I mean, I mean, what I said that I have some knowledge of uh, that uh, this will become possible in the future. That you know, according to unpublished, uh, you know, some things that are on the way. Let's put it this way. I've seen data that is very promising. But uh, to my knowledge, it hasn't been uh, published yet for, for birds. Are they germline transmissible cells? or they are Yeah, not... very good question. I, I cannot tell you because it's not published yet. Okay. 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 I apologize for that. But, you know, I just said it. I mean, it's promising, but uh, I, I, I cannot uh, comment on that. Sorry. Okay. Thank you. So Thanks. if anybody any, anybody else has got any question, there is, a, there is a chat box in the chat box. Something was there. Mika, can you look into that? Sir? Yes. Um, how IPSL based animal technology improved animal welfare? Wow, this is a uh, this is a big uh, uh, big question. Um, yeah, I mean uh, it's uh, it's it's a really it's a really good question. Uh, so I mean you can you know I think that all animals have the right to live and also the ambition to live. You know, that's what I would say, because, you know, uh, everyone is trying to avoid predation and death and so on and so forth and injury. So I'd say that, I mean, uh, intrinsically, everything would like to live. So uh, if I carry on this line of uh, philosophy, I'd say that uh, hypersect technology will let uh, our species fulfill their destiny, which is to exist. Okay. But uh, I'm not sure, sure uh, how to take it. I mean, uh, maybe the question, if someone asked me a you know, more specific question, uh, I can think about that. But it's a very interesting question. The other question that is there, uh, cell-based therapies being explored in immune-related disorders in animals. Also a very good question. Um, I'd say probably not yet. But I'm aware of uh, immune oncology with very similar, uh, I mean, immunotherapy. Uh, also, student, pre in students of, that have, uh, a student that uh, have, that did the PhD with me is actually pursuing, pursuing uh, uh, immunotherapy, but using antibodies in animals, uh, pets, and pets in cats and cats uh, and dogs and so on and so forth. So I'm not sure that cell-based therapies are explored. I really don't know. But I'd say that the first step towards that, you know, so antibody mediated immunotherapy is actually taking place already uh, as we speak. The first steps are, are taking place. Okay. Okay. So, Mika, I know that we have put you into travel. You are traveling now in and some other countries from one to, and to the other time zone. So, I would I would like to, we would like to wish you good good night quickly. <laughs> Go and have Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, so much, Mika for making yourself, even though despite having a busy schedule and you are traveling, still you are it's available. And uh, all I wanted to get all these youngsters inspired and initiate their own thing. Yeah. Exactly. I hope that uh, I serve the purpose and uh, that uh, they are inspired. They will be They will be in touch if they want anything from... Good, good. Um, I'm always looking for talent as well. I mean, if anyone is interested to work on these topics or others, I mean, uh, give me a ring. Okay, sure. I'll tell them. I'll, I'll make sure that they are. They will.